And why don't we stand to our feet? We're going to welcome Sam. And why don't we give him a huge round of applause as he comes to share the word today. Praise God. God is good. You all can be seated. God is really so good, isn't he? Hey, I don't usually do this, but when I come into the service this morning, and I had to check myself a several, several times on it, but God was speaking to me about one of the young people in the church. And uh, there's a young person here today, and I usually, Kevin knows me for many years, I hardly ever speak out like this, but God was really moving on me that I had to. There's a young person here in the church that God has called him into the mission field. And they're scared because they know the situation they're in. There is no way they can go to the mission field. But I want to tell you that God is sending you a message this morning that the situation you are in, don't be concerned about it. Because he controls situations. That all you need to do is step out. You know, God called me to the mission field. I was not a young man. The person here this morning, you're a young person. I want to tell you, please, don't be concerned about your situation. When God called me to the mission field, I had a successful life going on. I had a construction company. Uh, I'll ask it again. How many of you seen the movie Machine Gun Preacher? <clears throat> you know, in the movie Machine Gun Preacher, it didn't really show everything just how it was. It was a two-hour and ten-minute movie showing about 20-plus years of my life. So it didn't show you the situation I was in. I was in a situation of running and owning a construction company, a very successful construction company. I had all the man toys. I had everything going on in my life. I used to go on hunting trips. You know Americans, we love to go hunting. I would go on hunting trips and spend $10,000 and $15,000 a year just to go shoot elk and go shoot other animals. I had everything going on in my life. I owned 17 houses. I owned eight stores. I had no reason to go to the mission field. My life, everything was happening in my life. I had a plan, listen to this, I had a plan to retire at 50 years old. God messed it all up. <laughs> God messed it all up because now the only retirement I have and I look forward to is till the day that God takes me from this world <clears throat> into that kingdom. But I want to share a little bit about the word here today, or excuse me, about the work here today in Africa. You know, we've been working in Ethiopia. We work in the South Sudan. We work in Uganda. We have just recently started in the Congo. This work all started out so little. You know, sometimes you sit there and you say, well... God just can't do it for me. I want to tell you something. If you are willing to start out little, God can make it big. But the problem is everyone wants to start out up here. You know, the ministry that I'm going to tell you today all about started out with a mosquito net hanging in a tree. There was no money. There was no buildings. And now there's projects in many different countries. Also, we do a lot of work in America. We have about 350 children in our care 24-7. We have eight children in university. Before COVID, uh, <coughs> I think we had over 20 children in university. How our organization works, and you don't hear too many people that do this, if you are 70% in your class growing up, 70% or better, and you want to go to university, we will pay to send you to university. So some of you people think you got school fees, you ought to see my school fees. There is no government schools in Africa. You got to pay for every child to go to schooling. Uh, but I, I'm telling you, if you want to change a nation, it's Jesus Christ first. Then it's education is how you change a nation. It's through also teaching a skill and a trade. 
Uh, a few things that our organization does that I really like to push for people to look at is drilling wells. If you're here today and you want to be involved with drilling a well and saving thousands of lives, I'm going to tell you to see Kevin afterwards. Kevin has a machine. He can take your credit card and run it to a don't run no more. But you can drill a well in and, and a third world country. How many people here has ever worked in a third world country before? You know, in most third world countries, when you want to drill a well, you're not allowed to just drill the well. You have to go to the government. And the government tells you where to drill the well. I've been in Africa for two and a, over two and a half decades we look for the needed areas to drill the well. We normally look for places where people are dying of parasites and dying of bad water. And we go in and we drill the well. Then we tell the government where we have drilled the well. We have drilled over 50 wells over the years. The average well runs between nine and $10,000 to drill. But the average well serves and saves at least 2,000 people. Imagine just going home and laying your head down and knowing that you saved over 2,000 people. <clears throat> Some of the work that we got going on in Uganda, it's not just orphanages. Everyone knows how I feel about an orphanage. God spoke to me a number of years ago. If you're just going to build another orphanage, stay home. I believe that we need to be teaching a skill and a trade to young people. Why should we save them when they're little if we're going to let them go into prostitution when they become 15 or 16 years old? And that's what happens to young people in a third world country if we don't teach them a skill and a trade. So over the years, we started teaching skills and trades from in a restaurant, now into farming, ranching, and irrigation. We have supermarkets, we have hotels, we have so much going on. We have over 580 people on the payroll. Now, I love to tell that some people, they hear me preach and they say, all he does is brag for hours. That's right. What Jesus Christ is doing in my life. See, there's a big difference <clears throat> when you stand up and you boast about all the things that you have there's a big difference of somebody standing up and saying about all the things that Jesus Christ has done in their life. See, the Word tells us we can shout it from a rooftop. And I believe that as Christians, we need to get back to telling people what Jesus is doing in their life. Now, we got some unbelievable projects going on. We're going to watch a video here in a couple minutes. And it's about a project called the Bush Kids Project. <clears throat> in two and a half decades, we have never done a project on this scale. And just recently, it's been going on for 25 months, 26 months. Recently, we took the mission team out that comes. We have three mission teams that come in every year from around the world. We took them on this project, and everyone's heart was moved. But I want you to imagine having a project that you go deep into the bush. But how do we know where to go? We send what we call runners out into the bush of northern Uganda. And a runner will go out and what they're looking for is villages with fresh graves. And fresh graves from elderly and also children. Children dying of malaria, children dying of bacteria infections, Something that you probably never heard, some statistics, and I'm telling you the low statistics, they say a child dies every two minutes, malaria. I believe there's something we should be doing. So we go in four-wheel drive vehicles. We go deep into the bush on cow trails. We take doctors. We take nurses. We take a blood lab, and we go in and we begin to treat children. This project is unbelievable. When we watch this video, I want you to listen close to the cries in the background. I want you to look at the children that parents will bring in and they'll lay on the mat because there is no hope for that child but you. 
When you support this project, that is the hope that these children have. And people will say, well, no, you got to remember, God is, should be everybody's hope. But you need to remember, God works through people like us. God does his miracles when he, has a, when he has a vessel to go out and not just bring the medicine, but bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to really watch this video closely. And then we're only going to do a couple questions. I told the pastor and his wife, I want them to think of a couple hard questions for me. And then we're going to get straight into the word. Let's watch the video. We have the Bush Kids Project. Hey, here we are today. We're starting on the third phase of the Bush Kids Project. Uh, you can see behind me, we have Pastor Michael. Uh, Pastor Michael is here from the U.S., from Three Seas Church, which is also a part of Angels of East Africa. Uh, his wife, Evelina, which is the CEO that runs the office in the U.S., is here. Uh, this is their first time being out. They're, they're actually here uh, in East Africa over Christmas. They'll be at all the projects, but they're here today. Uh, uh, looking over the Bush Kids Project. And there again, it's just, it's just uh, amazing and it's almost unbelievable how many kids will end up coming out to this Bush Kids Project. You can see behind me, they're still walking in. Uh, we've only been here for a little over an hour. We're probably about 80 children already come walking in. We've already treated a few kids, malaria, deworming everyone we're suspecting you know we, do, we won't know to the end of the day but we're suspecting 200 children to come through here today Evelina we're here today on your first day out on the Bush Kids Project just give me a little bit of what you've seen coming in here today. Um, I've seen children that are really, really, really sick. Um, it, it started out with just a few children on a mat. Now, what, what do you think we're averaging here now? How many kids do you think we have here now? At least 100, 200. Yeah. You've seen some children that's been pretty sick? Mm -hmm. Uh, you think this is a project that needs to go on? Yes, for sure. Um, okay. I hope we keep it going for the next couple of months, but we need sponsors. We need people that are willing to, to commit to saving these children. We need your help. All right. Thank you. On that project started in the middle of COVID in Uganda. <clears throat> it was a hard project to start. So many people tried to shut it down. They said, no, they said, Sam, you can't go in. But I told them, I said, let's look at statistics. Let's look at how many people are dying of COVID. And let's look at how many children are dying in the bush right now. And uh, about a week later, the government got back with me and they said, do your thing. So if you're here today, I want you to really think about the Bush Kids Project. Uh, <clears throat> I've never done a project on this scale. 27 years of being in Africa, we have never done anything like this. And Evelina, if you noticed when she broke... A mother walked in with a child that was basically no hope, dying, almost dead. And the mother laid the child on the mat and walked away. And when Evelina seen it, she heard me telling the stories how they do that. But then she seen it with her own eyes and she broke. And uh, <clears throat> Evelina has been on the Bush Kids Project several times. 
uh, about a year, uh, year ago or a little longer. I don't want to say the math wrong, but she was seven months pregnant and went on the Bush Kids Project. And I tried to tell her no. And she said, listen, you can't tell me no. So this year she went on the Bush Kids Project several months later. And the child, my grandson, was uh, nine months old. And he was on the Bush Kids Project. And it was just the most amazing thing, most awesome opportunity I've ever had in life. You know, so here we have not just a lady and her husband that is on fire for the work in Africa, but they are teaching their child from seven months in the womb to nine months old to be in the mission field. All right, I'm going to let you ask a couple questions. I'm going to start off with the pastor here. And I like to do this anywhere I go around the world. Because at the end of the meeting here today, you're going to have the opportunity to sow in to the work that we do in Africa. Now, I believe as a missionary, if I'm asking you to sow in to the work that we do, I believe you should be allowed to ask me any question you would like to ask. So it can be something about the movie Machine Gun Preacher. It can be something about my past. It can be something that you may have read on the internet, good or bad. So any question you would like, because at the end, I'm going to ask you to sow into all these projects. We feed over 10,000 mills a day. We have built seven schools. We're building number eight school right now. We have projects in four different countries going on. Uh, two and a half decades later, we just started in another war. So I really need your help today. So any question, go ahead, Pastor. Okay, 27 years <clears throat> in Africa. Mm. What has been your biggest personal challenge? You know, <clears throat> I think my biggest personal challenge is because of the movie, because of being a businessman all my life, I had a lot of friends, still have a lot of friends, but I had a lot of people that I thought when I stepped out was going to follow me and back me. And then I found out that's not true. You know, somebody asked me, they said, well, in the movie, you was always angry all the time. When I first started in the mission field, it's so true. I was angry because I was a businessman. I was a professional businessman and successful businessman. I thought that all my friends that was just like me, when I came back with a story of children dying and pictures of children that were dying of starvation, I thought everyone would help me. And then I found out it doesn't work like that. So it took me years to get to the point that all God judges us for is what we are able to do. You know, so I challenge all of you here today. Just do what you know you can do without a shadow of a doubt. And I tell you what's going to end up happening. God is going to help you to step out and even do more. You know, I've been challenging <coughs> Christians for the last few years. You know, it's like we always go to bed telling God what we need. Did you ever do that? We go to sleep telling God what we need. Imagine going to bed and asking God, what can I do for you? Imagine getting up in the morning and asking God, God, what can I do for you today? See, when you change everything around and make your life about God, what can I do for you? He starts meeting all your needs and you don't have to ask him for anything. He starts putting money in your hands and you don't have to ask him for money. He'll start taking care of you. He'll start making you healthy because he needs you to do kingdom work. So I challenge you today, start a new life by saying, God, what can I do for you? Go ahead. Um, just you've explained that you've got a lot of projects on in East Africa. What would you estimate the total cost of running all of that, the orphanages, the projects, the bush kids, everything that you're doing um, over a cost of a year? We operate our nonprofit. We are a legit nonprofit out of America. We are a NGO 501c3 out of America. 
and we also are a nonprofit NGO in Uganda. That is also a mother office. We operate the entire ministry on a roughly $2 million a year, give or take a little bit. I'm very big into business. You know, when you work 580 some people a day, you got a lot of business. Our businesses are for-profit business. The biggest company that I run is our security company. Our security company does very well. It's a high-risk company. That company alone, on paper, showing it without a shadow of a doubt, puts about $8,000 a month into the work that we do in Africa. So we operate on a little over $2 million a year. So, you know, if you're not quite sure how to write that check out, I can help you. <laughs> Somebody else, let's do two more questions and we got them right there. Thank you. Last night you said that us Australians are nice and we don't ask hard questions. <laughs> and when I was talking to you outside, you yep. gave a couple of examples of hard questions. Yeah. So I'm going to pick one up from what you mentioned. Okay. So how much from out of a dollar that we give goes in a mission? So how do you administer one dollar or you know, dollar that you give? All organizations in the U.S., depending what state you are established in, they get audited. The state that I'm in, in Pennsylvania, now if you notice, a lot of your big ministries go Texas. Is the Texas lady here today? But a lot of big ministries go Texas because there is no audit for any amount of money you bring in. So in uh, Pennsylvania, our audit for an NGO, 501c3, is three quarters of a million dollars. You have to be audited every year, a state audited. <clears throat> so we don't only have a office, we have a office lady that does our accounting, but then we have to go to a certified accountant, then we go to a state auditor. It's very tough to run a nonprofit in the state of Pennsylvania. Now because of these audits, they have shown our people that support us. And now listen, your average nonprofit is 15 cent or less on a dollar. We are from 54 cent to 68 cent on a dollar. It's almost unbelievable. How can it happen? It's because we have so many businesses we can operate like that. <clears throat> we have a motorcycle shop in Pennsylvania. It's called MGP Rat Bikes. You can Google it. You can go online. There's a store there. There's a clothing line. There's motorcycle gear. There's motorcycles to buy, cars to buy. Everything that we do, all the profits go back to the work in Africa and the work we do in America. So that's why we're able to show uh, 54 cent to 68 cent on the dollar. So I love questions like that. And I want to tell you, <clears throat> you have every right to ask questions. And if people don't want to ask questions, don't give them your money. Somebody else over here had their hand up. Okay. This, this sounds like a dumb question, but um, in logic, why do the women keep on having children in conditions like that? I mean, that question I love. You know, in Africa, the average family is only four or five children. I think that some places in America, they double that, okay, because of the welfare system. A lot of those families in America that have a lot of children do it because of welfare. They get money per child from the welfare system. In Africa, I want you to get this. There is no elderly home. There is no welfare or assistant money. Parents depend on their children to take care of them when they get old. So I see why people in Africa will have five children. Because those five children, listen, in America, if you're elderly, if you don't have no money, you go to an unbelievable home. 
My mom has recently died. She was 87 years old when she died. My mom had a little bit of money. Because she had money, we put her in a really nice home. But they charged almost 9,000 U.S. dollars per month. But see, there is nothing like that in Africa. Your children is your future. You know, so in what happens a lot of times, they say, well, why can't they take care of themselves? You look at a lot of people in Uganda, where the land I call is like the land of milk and honey. People can farm their land and survive with no problem. Where they have the problem is when they're in an area that is infested with warlords, that are infested with rebel groups that come in and kill, steal. And that's where the problems run. Otherwise, many of these places, especially Uganda, now some other countries in Africa, they go through droughts, they have a lot of problems going on, but Uganda is like the land of milk and honey. I love them questions. Let's do two more because I got plenty of time here for the message. Two more here and then one in the back. <clears throat> yeah, Sam, you talked about the, the warlords. Um, was it Joseph... Coney, the, um, the leader of the rebels? Uh, in, no, in his, it started out his aunt was actually the leader of the rebels. And his aunt used to say that she had 60-some demons within her that would tell her what to do. And then when the aunt died, Joseph Coney came in. And Joseph Coney claimed to have over 200 and some devils or demons within him. And he even would brag that my aunt's demons have come to me now. Now, Joseph Coney is supposedly in the Congo. I don't know why I went to the Congo. Maybe I'm still looking for him. But anyways, we won't go there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Joseph Coney is supposed to be in the Congo. There are rumors that he's dead. I don't believe that he's dead. I believe that those rumors are so he can come back into East Africa and start living amongst the people again. But all that I know, I don't care if you're with ISIS. I don't care if you're with ADF. I don't care if you're with Islamic State. Keep your hands off of children or I'm going to give you a problem until God takes me out of this world. Our children is our future worldwide. It doesn't matter if we're in Australia, if we're in UK, America, or Africa. We need to get back to taking care of our children once again. <clears throat> what would you say is the most, um, the experience that impacted you the most in Africa? You know, there's a lot of things that... I don't talk because, you know, there's always children in my meetings and, and I want to minister to everyone, the youngest, uh, from the youngest all the way to the oldest. But there was a few things that I've seen years ago that I hope I never have to look at again. But I've seen everything from, you know, uh, one time the LRA, the Lord Resistant Army, raided a village and they went into a school and they, they cut up a lot of people, mainly children. And a couple days after, the parents came in. And the parents was taking body parts, trying to think it was their children. And you know, my grandmother used to always say, every bad thing, something good can come out of it. And I was wondering one day, how could something good come out of something so sad, so horrible? <clears throat> About two years after that happened, there was a picture that went into the newspaper in Kampala, Uganda. And that picture showed me standing with a bunch of kids alongside of me and everything. Well, a guy came to one of my orphanages in Gulu, and he came to the gate. And he asked for me. So one of the guards come in. They said, Sam, there's a guy at the gate asking for you. So I go out to the gate and the guy says to me, he's holding the newspaper. He said, so you're Samuel Childers. And he said, all of these children are yours. And I said, yes. And he says, this boy in this picture, is he with you? 
And I said, well, just so happens he's here today at this orphanage, but he's mainly in South Sudan. And the man started shaking. And he said, can I see him? And I said, well, you know, yeah, you can see him. That's it, you know, because I didn't know everything what he wanted. And he was shaking so bad. So they bring the child out. As soon as he sees the child, he passes out. He falls over, he passes out. They wake him up, they set him back up, and the child is standing in front of him again. He passes out. So finally he wakes up and I start talking with him and he said, that boy is my nephew. That can't be him. So the boy come over and was talking to him, calling him uncle and everything, and he says, well, I'll be back. So a few days later he comes back and this time he comes back with his father. And the father comes to the gate. And when the father came to the gate, we brought the child out. And the father passed out, fell to the ground, was shaking on the ground. And he said, no way, no way that can be my son. He was one of the parents that picked up body parts and buried as their child. A miracle happened from the children that was rescued. And the child that they buried was not their child. So even something horrible, something bad, something good can always come out of it. And you know the most awesome thing? That was about two weeks before Christmas. So that Christmas, they had a Christmas they never thought they would ever have again. They had their child home with them. So that was an awesome story. Hey, I got a couple questions for you. I have a short message here today. And I have a couple questions, and you don't have to answer these questions out loud. We don't want no one lying in the church. But the first question is, how far are you willing to go to get in the presence of God? How far are you willing to go to get into God's presence? How far are you willing to go to receive His blessings? How far are you willing to go to receive His favor? What are you willing to do to literally get in the presence of God? Are you willing to drop everything? Or are you just willing to go to church maybe on Sunday morning a couple times a month? You know, I don't know Australia, but I know Americans. And the average American Christian only goes to church once a month on Sunday morning. And they're usually late. How far are you willing to go or are you satisfied to live and dwell in your situation you are in? You know, the problem with us as Americans, we get into a situation and we're in that situation for so long, we just get used to it and we don't even want to get out of it. You know, the welfare system in America... My dad would be a hundred and some years old right now if he was alive. My dad was a hard man. When I used to hear my dad talk about the welfare system, it was amazing to hear him talk about it. See, the welfare system in America was made for the hardworking man, the hardworking family that got into a situation to help them get out. But now it has turned into a career. Now see, I don't know Australia, but I got a feeling it could be the same thing worldwide in a Western country that has a well-established government and the government wants to get you eating out of their hands. That's how they will begin to control you is when you get into the system. See, I want to tell you something. That's called a situation, and I don't want in that situation. See, God gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge, and he gives us faith that we can go out and work a proper job. 
You know, I don't know your country, but I know in America right now, the market is open. You can almost name your price to work. I was telling someone the other day, the pastor and some of the deacons from the church, that in America right now, at uh, uh, McDonald's, the highest paid McDonald's that I heard in our area is $21 an hour. In my hometown, McDonald's is paying $16 an hour. They still can't find people to work. Because people are stuck in the situation where they want the free money. See, I want to tell you something. See, there were situations even in the Bible days. There were situations in the Bible days, but there was men of God. There was men that wanted to be men no matter what their situation they were going through. They were going to get out of it to get in the presence of God. See, when you get in the presence of God, what happens in your life? He begins to change you. He begins to mold you. He begins to strengthen you. He'll take you from here to here. He'll give you so much that it's unbelievable. I want to read something here from Luke. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19. There was a man... Excuse me, there was a man there named Zach, Zach, Zacharias. I hope I'm saying that right. Zacharias. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. But listen to this next verse. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short. That's a serious situation to be in. Can you imagine that? So he hears Jesus is coming through the town, okay? I believe there's a lot of things and stories like this that's left out of the book. It's left out, but I want you to think about his situation. Jesus is coming through town. And he wanted to get in the presence of Jesus. He wanted to, to see Jesus close up. So he began to running out where Jesus was walking through. But he was too short. Can you imagine that? He's trying to look over everyone's shoulders. But you see, that day, he got it in his mind, I am going to get in the presence of God no matter what I have to do. So he started figuring out where Jesus was going to be walking. See, this was a serious thing. He just didn't go out and find a road that there was some trees on it. He had to find out where Jesus was going to be walking. And then I love the word of God, what it says, okay? It says that he found a tree. He just didn't find an ordinary tree. He found a tree that day that was hanging over the road. And some of you might say, well, I never heard it say that before. It said it because it said that Jesus was walking down the road and he looked up. He looked up and seen him. So that means that this man was running down the road looking for the perfect opportunity to get in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, sometimes if you really want to get in his presence... You got to search. You got to plan. You got to get yourself out of your situation to get into God's presence. See, he he had something. He could have just said, "Well, you know, I'm just going to stand here on the side of the road. You know, I might get up on I might get up on this rock over here, and I'll just stand up on the rock and I'll wave at Jesus." No, he said, "I will be getting in the presence of God today." Don't be satisfied in the situation that you are living in. Don't think there's no way it can change because I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your situation you're in. God can change it. See, Jesus looked up and he told him, he said, come on down. I'm coming to your house today. And see, right away, what started to happen? 
What starts to happen to us when we get in the presence of God? We start to repent. You don't have to tell people to repent. I don't know if you have them here in Australia, but we have these so-called religious people in America that want to stand on the roadside and tell people to repent. It's stupid. You don't have to tell nobody to repent. Just get them in the presence of God. Because when you get in the presence of God, that's when you start to feel unclean, when you're in the presence of God. Nobody has to tell you what your sin is. You know, a lot of Christians, they say, well, I don't have no sin. You just called God a liar then. That's in the word of God. But nobody has to tell you the sin in your life. When I get around prophets and people that want to be a so-called prophet, I always ask them, don't tell me good things that's going to happen to me because I can tell you the good things. Tell me the bad things I'm hiding. We all got sin in our life. <clears throat> but when you get in the presence of God, it begins to change. Meanwhile, Zacharias stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. See, when we get into the presence of God, we start knowing without a shadow of a doubt all the bad things that we have done. And we want to change it. We don't want to just share it with our neighbor. We want to begin to tell God, God, I'm going to change. God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And that's exactly what happened. And it says here, Jesus replied, salvation has come to your house today. For this man showed himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. See, there's people here today, you're stuck in a situation. <clears throat> See, I want to tell you a little bit of my situation. I was a drug addict. I have a third book that they're getting ready to, Ghost Rider is getting ready to work on in January. And that third book is titled, The Most Unlikely. That's the title. When you open up that third book, the full title is inside. The most unlikely never to succeed in life, Sam Childers. Why? Because Sam Childers was a drug addict. Sam Childers was a thug. Sam Childers was a no good you know what. He was just somebody that the devil had a hold of. But see, something happened to Sam Childers. See, I could have just gave my life to the Lord. I could have gave my life to the Lord. I could have went into the church and said, here I am, God. But see, there's something that God wants to hear from you today. And it's not, here I am, God. It's, here I am, God, use me. See, God can use each and every one of us. But so many times we start looking at our qualifications. And we're not looking at the miracles that God can do in your life. I am totally non-educated. You know, most people don't even hear this unless you hear me preach it. When I was 16, 17, 20, 25 years old, I could not read or write. People say, well, how can you do that today? I got Bible on tape. See, I want to tell you something. God will prepare you for what he has for you. I have no education at all, but I, I teach around the world in unbelievable colleges. Pepperdine. I spoke in Pepperdine years ago. And how could a man with no education, a man that could not speak, he stuttered, a man that was a heroin addict, a drug addict, how could he speak in a college like Pepperdine? Because God took me there. See, God wants to take you to a place today 
that you cannot go on your own. But you have to be willing to get out of your situation. I speak in business conferences around the world. Kevin just sat me up with a business conference in New Jersey speaking to a union company, getting an unbelievable amount of money. How can that happen? Because God took me out of my situation and put me into his situation, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ worldwide. In a few minutes, we're going to pray. There's some of you here today, you're stuck in a situation that's been generation after generation after generation. And you want out, but you think there's no way God can use you. <clears throat> I told the story last night of being on the mountain in Colorado. See, even when I started getting out of my situation, even when God made me a businessman, even when I had 17 houses and eight stores and was running a construction company, I had something in my life that was a serious situation. I couldn't speak. I stuttered every other word. I was already successful. See, I didn't have to go any further. But you got to want it. When God asked me on that mountain, I'm about to take you out to the nations to carry the message of hope. He said this afterwards. He didn't snap his fingers and say, you are going out to the nations. He didn't say that. He said, are you willing? God wants to hear from you today. Are you willing to get out of the situation you're in? Are you willing to change? I'm going to tell you something. I look out here today and you know what I see? Miracles that are ready to be birthed. See, that's an awesome thing. I was in the church the other day and somebody said, what do you see here in our church? And I said, I see stagnant water stagnant water that even has a stench. I don't see that here today. I see miracles that are ready to be birthed. Now, what are you willing to do about that? <clears throat> In three minutes, I'm going to ask you, if you're here today and you have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, Maybe you walked away from him. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to him. In three minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Not yet, but in three minutes. See, in three minutes, you can have a new beginning. I told my testimony a little bit last night. There was a time when I gave my life to the Lord. I couldn't even stand up. My legs went numb. I was sitting in the back of the church. I wanted to do it, but I couldn't stand up. So I want to tell you today in three minutes, whether you stand or you're setting, you're going to have the opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you know who I was speaking to about being in the situation and you think there's no way out of your situation. We can get financially bound that we can't hardly turn around. I want to tell you something. God can get you out of it. People say to me in America, you don't understand. I'm ready to file bankruptcy. And I always ask them, if God gets you out of the situation, are you willing to stay out of that situation? See, something that happens with people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol and other different things. God can help them get out of it, but they go right back into it. Because they never fully surrendered. Today, if you're here, in two minutes, you're going to have the opportunity and stand up and say, God, I'm surrendering my situation, and I want to be in your presence. See, there's something about getting in the presence of God. 
There's just something about getting in the presence of God. It doesn't matter where it's at. You can be riding down the road in your car, in your truck. You can be on your motorcycle. You can be in church. You can be at your house. But when you get in the presence of God, things start to change. Things start to come off you. Your health begins to change. You begin to feel healthier. In one and a half minutes, if you want to get in the presence of God, if you want God to touch you, heal you, maybe you walk through these doors today and you were broken inside. I can feel some of you in here, man. I can feel it. You're broken. You're lost. You feel like no one loves you. But I want to tell you something. You are special in the eyes of God. You will never feel lost again. You will never feel unloved again. Once you get in the presence and you stay in that presence, you will always be able to share love once you get in His presence. If you're here today and you are determined I am not going to walk out of this church the same way I walked in. It doesn't matter if you served God for five years, 10 years, or 20 years, or all your life. God can take you to another level. If you want to go to that next level, stand to your feet right now as I begin to pray. Just stand to your feet. If you want to go to another level with Jesus Christ, stand to your feet no matter who you are if you say today I'm going to go all the way today I'm going to change my situation because I'm placing it before God the first prayer we're going to pray is a prayer of salvation I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me you can whisper it you can say it out loud you can think it but Christians I want all the Christians in here to say this prayer. Repeat it after me as loud as you can. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I'm here today and I'm lost and I'm full of sin. But I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me I ask you to make me whole. I ask your Holy Spirit to begin to dwell in me. I ask you to heal me, change me. I ask you to use me. And I ask you to allow me to be part of the family. Your family, Lord. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, some of you here today, you know when I'm talking about a situation. You know the situation that you're in. Maybe you're in a situation, it's an unequally yoked relationship. God can change it. Maybe if you're not married and you're in that unequally yoked relationship, Maybe you need to turn now and run and don't look back. If you're in a situation where you're unequally yoked, but you're married, work on it. Work on it. See, my wife was saved many years before me. She used to take a prayer hanky to the church. And she would have that prayer hanky anointed in oil. And people would come up front and they would pray over it. Nobody knew what they were praying for. But she would have them pray over it. And she would take that hanky home. And she would cut it up into little pieces. She put it everywhere. I'd put my hand in my pocket and I'd be like, what the heck is this? A little tiny piece of a hanky. I found them in my underwear drawer. I found them everywhere you could imagine. But it worked. If you're here today and you just need God to strengthen you, maybe take away 
fear, anxiety, thoughts of suicide. Maybe it's addictions. There's addictions coming all different ways. In America, they got addictions to drinking Coca-Cola. Okay, Coca-Cola. Watching TV. I don't know what your addiction is. But I want to tell you something about addictions. They can keep you away from the presence of God. It can be television. Now you Aussies ain't going to like me now. It can be football. I don't care if you like me or not after this. I'm leaving in one hour. Whatever your addiction is, in 30 seconds we're going to pray. And it's going to leave you. Maybe you need to just be filled with love. But I want everybody here as I begin to pray, I want you to begin to pray. And I want you to take your needs before the King. I want you to take your needs before the Lord. I want you to begin just telling Him, God, take away this addiction whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, drugs whatever it is I want you to begin taking it to Him whatever you need today whether it be a financial miracle whether it be a healing from the Lord Jesus Christ I want you to begin to cry out from within your heart just begin to cry out to Him place it before Him right now And as I pray, and you know God is getting ready to touch you, I want you to lift your hands and just begin to worship Him and begin to thank Him at the end of this prayer for delivering you today from your situation. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you today broken and lost and hurting. We come to you today in need of a miracle. We come to you today with a bad situation. We come to you today of a situation that we need you to break, change, tear down. Father, as a servant of God, I'm asking you to begin miracles within your people. Deliver them from anxiety. Deliver them from thoughts of suicide. Deliver them from addictions. Deliver them today from hatred. Fill them with the love that is the greatest gift that you give us, Lord. Fill us all with your love. Change us, heal us, strengthen us. Allow us to go through this week as a warrior. Allow us to go through the next few months, the next few years, the rest of this life as a warrior. Father, place your presence upon us like never before. Allow it to cling to us, Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit to cleanse us and move us, heal us. Allow us to begin to have a desire to change our community to change our family with the love of your son Jesus Father use each and every one of us here today and we ask it in Jesus name Amen, Amen you can be seated you know I feel something has really happened here to many of you today Don't go back to that situation. And I'm going to tell you a quick story before the pastor comes up. I got a message that I always preach about a boy with one boot. In Juba, a number of years ago, there was a massacre that went on. And thousands of people were slaughtered in the streets. And my men rescued a truckload of children out of this massacre. They brought him back to the orphanage. One little boy lost everything but a torn up pair of shorts and one boot. So I told the staff, I said, take all the children down, wash them, give them new clothes, give them new shoes, feed them, put them in the dorms, give them a good night's rest. 
So a few hours later, I'm looking out the window of my house and I couldn't believe what I seen. I seen this little boy standing under a tree with that one boot on. That was it. One boot. No clothes, one boot. He was maybe five, six years old. So I walked out on the porch on my veranda. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I told the staff to give him clothes. So I called the staff over. I said, what's going on with the kid? Why didn't you give him clothes? They said, we did. We gave him clothes. We gave him new shoes. He walked over, took them all off, and he found that old boot, and he put that old boot back on. So I said, he's five, six years old. Who's in control, him or you? So they went and did it again. The next morning, I look outside. He's standing under that tree with one boot. I had to leave that day to go back to Kampala. So I left that little boy, and the last thing I seen was a five, six-year-old little boy standing with one boot on. But uh, about a month later, I come back to the orphanage. And I get out, and the first kid that comes running up to me was that little boy. I didn't even recognize him. He's all dressed up, new shoes on. And he looked down, or I looked down upon him, and I said, what happened to you, man? And a little five-year-old, six-year-old little boy looked up at me and he said, well, I thought it was time just to start over. Time to start over. What does our ministry do? We rescue children. We rescue children with one boot on. And we give them an opportunity to change their life. See, that little boy thought he lost everything. All he could remember was his family being killed. All he had was that one boot. But he came to look at his situation. And he knew it was time to start over. Our ministry rescues children. We feed children. We give children the opportunity to start over. Over the years, it hasn't been a few. It hasn't been a couple hundred. It's been thousands of children. Our feeding program alone right now is over 10,000 meals a day. And you want to know something? I can't take the credit for none of that. It's people like you that help me. My last plea is, I need your help. God bless you. I love you. Stay out of your situation. So good. Absolutely amazing. Why don't you take your seats just for a moment? We're going to help. I believe as a church, so this is a generous church and this was not a planned on our schedule kind of um, experience to have Sam come, but it was an opportunity that I believe that we've, you know, when, when the opportunity presented and the elders and, 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 and Rachel and I discussed it, we thought we've got to take this opportunity to get and hear Sam's story and I think it's been life changing and life impacting and, and we're going to help. Last night we took up a, a, a love offering. Today, we're going to take up another offering. And I don't want us to consider this a love offering. I want us to consider this an investment. Investment from our hearts into what the ministry is doing over in Africa. Every single cent of what is, is raised through this is actually going to go um, into Sam's ministry. Uh, so host, if you can part, um, start to prepare. Um, and Tate, I wonder if we could just put the screen up with the, the, the giving slide up there. This is how you can do that. We don't have a, a love offering card on the seats today. Uh, what we'd like you to do is just go to our website, harvestchurch.org.au slash give. There's a different ways in which you can give. You can give through online giving. What we need you to select is guest ministry. Uh, anything that comes through across, maybe you didn't come prepared today. 
But anything that comes through in this next week, we're actually going to pass through as well. Select guest ministry. If you're giving via FPOS or, or bank transfer, just write guest ministry or guest just in the description. Um, that helps us to be able to, um, to segregate those funds into, um, into a, a fund that we can actually pass on. You can also put cash in the containers as well. Or if you want to be able to contribute, you can see our team out at the info desk um, afterwards. Or you come and see Sam and, and, um, and Kevin personally as well. There's different ways in which you can get involved. Um, I think there's probably some business people who are here. You run your own businesses or maybe you own your own uh, organisation or you run that that we could significantly put into this ministry um, to, to see and make a difference. As you heard before, what it costs to, to run um, every year. Uh, we'd love to be able to make a dent in that. I was chatting with um, Sam earlier about the possibility of us taking a team to go over and see what he does over in Uganda. Maybe not Congo. But may, eh, who knows? But to go and see and be a part of a project, and he's telling me all these different ways in which we could be involved in that. So we're going to keep our ear to the ground and keep talking to these guys about seeing today. Is anybody here keen to go and visit Uganda? Yeah, okay, look, we've got a team already um, to go and do that. So I, I think that would be something that really cool for us to be involved in. So, hey, can we just um, can we just go and pray? We're going to pray for Sam. And we're going to receive this offering. Father, we pray right now for Sam's ministry over in Africa, angels of East Africa. Father, we pray right now that you would continue to bless and protect and guard, Lord God, and guide them and lead them into new situations that you have placed them in, Father. We pray for your anointing to go before because the the Word of God and the Gospel message of Jesus Christ is at the forefront of their lips. Father, we pray that this, that medical provision, Lord God, and financial provision would fall into their hands, Father, that they would be able to reach more people than they could ever possibly have imagined. We pray your blessing and anointing on them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We just encourage you, church, to be generous today. We're going to pass these containers. But if you want to give online anything that comes in that has guests on it all through this week, we're going to pass on in full um, to um, Sam's ministry. And that's great. Hey, I wanted to just take a quick moment. Um, to, to tell anybody here who made a decision today, you stood up, you made a decision, you prayed that prayer to, to start following Jesus. We would love to be able to meet you. And our team are going to be just outside the doors on the way out. They've got a Bible that they'd love to give you. Maybe you're online and you're going, you know what, I, I actually prayed that prayer as well. We'd love to be able to connect with you. Um, you can message us, email us. There's different ways in which you can do that uh, on the screen. Uh, one thing I do want to tell you about is that this Wednesday night, we are starting a brand new course called Following Jesus. Now, this course is for anybody who's maybe just made a decision, but it's not just for those people. Maybe you're going, I've been in church for a long time, but I really don't understand exactly what it means to follow Jesus. Rachel and I are going to be leading this course together um, on Wednesday nights here at 7 o'clock here at the church. Uh, there's information in the front of the Bibles on here. But if you just go to harvestchurch.org.au slash Jesus, you can do the same course online if you cannot make it to the church. But we'd love you to come and do it in person with us. It's open to everybody. It's a free course. Uh, and we'd love to help you on your discipleship journey to learn what it means to follow Jesus. So please um, get into that.